present my paper, although some of you may have read the abstract, and this was a little bit overambitious to talk about Bronze Age and Iron Age to Silly and Eurasia in 15 minutes, so I cut it very short, um, putting emphasis on the Iron Age, just a little bit of Bronze Age, but I'm happy to discuss other matters in the discussion, if you like. Now, could we turn this slide yes. down, because I think that would be great. No. Okay, thanks. While the phenomenon of sumptuous or elite graves of the Bronze and Iron Age are frequently discussed research topics, it is surprising that up until recently little attention has been paid to aspects of gender. If we look at the Bronze Age to start with, it is a fact that most, the most complex and rich burials or grave inventories belong to men. You see one here. With a few exceptions, mostly dating to the early Bronze Age, rich graves of women of the time before, before the 7th century BC are, as far as quality and quantity of the grave goods are concerned, not comparable to those of men. In the late Bronze Age, Urnfield culture, you see this here, the warrior, or warriorhood, is the most important social role which is indicated by graves of the highest social standing. Besides weapons, four-wheeled wagons, and bronze drinking vessels, there are, these are the most uh, important categories. Now, women's graves of this period, in contrast, sometimes com uh, contain complex dress accessories, exceptionally even made of gold, like this one here. None of them, however, can be regarded as equal to those of men. This picture is changing with the beginning of the early Iron Age in Central Europe at the turn of the 8th to the 7th century BC. For the first time, some women's graves can be compared to those of men as far as status items are concerned and thus cast a light on the changing social and religious status of women in some parts of Europe at the time. In my talk, I intend to contextualize these tubes and evaluate the status of women, the women buried in them. Moreover, I want to focus on wagon graves of women, a previously underrated phenomenon. And thus, I'm a bit, little bit conservative concerning the, your um, introduction. More than prestigious personal attire, wagons are indicators for the exceptional status or social status of their owners. And it's, it's the Hallstatt period, that is the early Iron Age, but for the first time, women of the highest social standing participated actively in representing power. As I hope to show, the high status graves of women with wagons and lavish drinking equipment, which was hitherto only characterizing male burials, can be understood as reflection for a more hierarchical organization of society through the development of the inheritance of status within certain families of high social standing. Now, this is well known. The well-known burial of Cumulus I of Weeks at the foot of the Hallstatt princely site of the Mont La Soire in Burgundy in eastern France is one of the richest prehistoric burials in Europe. The lady buried in the large wooden chamber died around 480 BC. She was lying on a four-wheeled wagon of Hallstatt type and according to Hallstatt burial custom. Her attire was of local style except her golden talk a unique Mediterranean import. It signifies her as a member of the ruling class. Next to one other, the Princess of Weeks, as she is normally referred to, is the only woman of her time so far we've discovered who wore, an, uh, wore this usually male attribute of rank and wealth. <coughs> Further great goods of the Lady of Weeks belong to the context of a symposium or libation rituals. Both are characteristic for funeral rituals of outstanding members of society of this time and uh, starting in the late Bronze Age, I've shown in the first slide. It is remarkable that all the bronze and pottery vessels in this graves are imports. The most impressive is the bronze crater of Greek manufacture, the largest surviving antique bronze vessel ever been discovered. Although her role as a ruler is now no longer doubted, 
The status of the Our Lady of Vic's earlier scholarship often reduced to a supposed role as a priestess, thus downplaying the other clearly worldly aspects of the grave imagery. Vic's grave, dating to the very end of the Hasha period, does not stand alone. There are a couple of women's graves in Iron Age Europe, which, except for the absence of weapons as a male privilege, re resemble in structure those of ostentatious or sumptuous are graves of men. The following criteria com are compulsory for sumptuous graves of both sexes, in my opinion. The existence of a four-wheeled or two-wheeled wagon, prestigious bronze or even precious metal dishes, optionally Mediterranean import, an elaborate grave construction, for example, in huge burial mounds, and then there being the central grave, and since the Hallstatt to two period, golden jewelry. If you look in contrast to Vix, to at an almost contemporary female grave from uh, southwest Germany, it is far richer in gold than the equipment of the Lady of Vix, but lacks indicators of power, a wagon, horse gear, and a drinking set, symbolizing actions in public space, and I think this is most vital. Therefore, female graves containing only golden jewelry are, in my view, of lesser rank than those of, with tokens of a role in public space as signs of power, although, of course, they nonetheless signify their bearers as members of the social elites. status led activities like the participation in symposial rituals and hosting of guests in life as well as in death and wag the, uh, the participation in wagon processions as signs of the highest social standing are in general attributed to men. Now, if we look to Etruria, Italy, in the 8th century BC, it is the time for the formation of the aristocrat uh, aristocratic societies of the Etruscan city-states. Here we are faced with a phenomenon of an abundance of outstanding burials of women most of them containing wagon burials. Oops, sorry, um, as they are mapped here. One of which, the Tomba Rigolini Galassi, is probably the most famous one, uh, was found in Cerveto and dating to the early 7th century BC. The inventory of this grave occupies, oops, here we are, occupies a whole room in the Vatican Museum, including vast amounts of metal vessels of bronze and silver, gold jewelry, a metal spindle, important, and a four-wheel cart for the funeral possession, but also a two-wheel chariot. The intimate lady named Latia was a member of the Etruscan aristocracy. The two-wheel chariot in the Italian women's graves manifest the high social position of those women and thus reflect a very different social reality than uh, that of the confined social space and the life of contemporary ladies in the Greek polis. This uh, particular aspect of Etruscan culture is also vividly expressed in visual depictions in palaces and temples, as you can see here. In Etruria, the special status of women can only be understood by their role within aristocratic families. Women guaranteed prosperity and continuity within a noble family, and thus the sustainability of status within the gentes family structure, the private and the public sphere merge. Or, as Petra Amann has pointed out, prince, quote, princely household and state became inseparable, unquote. Due to the archaeological finds, we may assume that gradually, also in the Hasha period north of the Alps, similar social developments as in Italy can be reconstructed, although we are far from uh, the formation of states here. The interpretation of these Etruscan ladies as members of emerging aristocratic families is a, giving us a model for understanding the phenomenon of wagon graves of ladies or women north of the Alps, which occur here for the first time in the beginning of the uh, 7th century, and I will start with a well-known find from Austria. Um, <clears throat> The sign for intensive context between Italy or Etruscan Italy and the Hallstatt world is probably one of the most spectacular aspects of the early Hallstatt period. A burial mound at Mitterkirchen in Upper Austria housed the tomb of a lady dating, I mean, the tomb dating to the early 7th century BC. The lady was buried with horse harness lying on a wagon box, if not uh, an entire wooden wagon. The lavish drinking set of pottery, made of pottery, characterizes her as a hostess who was probably likely 
also entitled to drink alcoholic beverages. The second slightly younger grave, here now from in Bavaria, Ida Albert it's called, again a wagon grave, um, might illustrate this. The woman was again lying on a four-wheeled wagon with horse gear and a yoke. And besides a meat offering and a pottery drinking and dining set for several symbolically present people, not in fact, um, she was given a bronze bowl, one of the very few Mediterranean imports of that time north of the Alps. This and some other contemporary burials, and also later ones, you see here the later stage of Leithauscher culture, with wagons and horse gear with enlarged burial mounds demonstrate that some women of the Hallstatt world or Hallstatt culture played an important role within their communities during this time and were therefore part of ancestor worship rituals in a funeral context. Now, if you go back very briefly, you see that the majority of burials with wagons, of course, are those of men. Oh, okay. Now, we look at this area. Coming back to Vix, we can observe that in some areas of the Hallstatt world, women obviously um, held higher status than in others. We may conclude that this high density of exceptionally sumptuous burials of ladies in the vicinity of the Montessoir again, and the absence of equally rich tombs of men, reflect the active role of women in politics. Now, we look at this one here. Um, one of the sumptuous burials near Vix is that of the lady buried in the tumulus la Butte. It contained a four-wheeled wagon, lavish golden jewelry, but most importantly, two iron axes as tools of sacrifice. Bloody sacrifice in the Greek and Roman world is a privilege of men, as well as tested in the literature. As shown by the archaeological record, however, in Etruria, which I cannot show you now because of the time, and in Celtic Burgundy, also high-status women could perform blood sacrifice. Now, wagon burials are not a common feature in all areas of the high shed world that is also well known. It is true, for instance, for the central eastern Alps, where we don't have uh, wagon burials, also maybe due to geography. Um, one example is the Dürnberg Cemetery. Uh, we're next, but then here, we're next to um, metal drinking sets, also here, and gold jewelry, you know that already. It is other items of status uh, which symbolize uh, the high status of women, in this case, scepters, which actually resemble spindles. As Margarita Gleben has recently emphasized, uh, the importance of metal spindles for aristocratic identity in Iron Age Italy. Finds are known from numerous Italian Etruscan elite cemeteries. Bologna, Este de Robio, and such. The Roman historian Vavo tells us that the distaff and the wool of Tanakil, wife of the first Etruscan king of Rome, Tarquinius Crispus, was shown for several centuries in the temple of the Ambos Sabine god Sampus on the Quirinal in Rome. The role, uh, the role of weaving and spinning as an aristocratic activity of the Etruscan and East Alpine Hushet culture finds no counterpart in the Celtic West Hushet culture. Here we don't have these um, graves. <coughs> now, on my map you see wagon graves with a wheel symbol, as well as women graves with metal drinking sets as a, with a jug symbol, and golden jewelry with the talk symbol. We may observe a shift or spreading of the wagon ideology for women from south to north, but also from east to west, from the east uh, Hushet's circle to the west. This concept of, so, of or social model of female rulers or powerful women remained intact until the end of the early Latin period and the ensuing Opida civilization, where we have a massive uh, change of social organization. Now, this map shows wagon barriers of women of the early Latin period of the 5th and 4th century BC. Still graves of high status women contain wagons and vessels. Again, some of the richest burials of this period are those of women, and I just show you one example. The eponymous grave of Bald Algesheim in the Rhineland, dating to the Latin B period, next to her golden jewelry as symbols of power, most likely God given power, since counterparts can be found in sacrificial offerings as well, is 
the chariot, which demonstrates political, if not even military status. And as well as a drinking set here of local manufacture, right? And in a prestigious Italian import as another aspect of public life activity. To conclude, oh, to conclude, neither Alba, Vix, Van Eidesheim, and other sumptuous burials reflect the changing social status of women in the Iron Ages. Complex, hierarchically organized lineages were formed at the time. In each of these lineages, or gentes, to use the Latin term, women who held a higher special status, not only as the mothers of the chiefs of the next generation, or the patres familiae, as you would call them. The model of a status-based function as mistress of the oikos, the household, had value within these societies of centralized proto-urban sites of the Hallstatt and early Latin period. You may assume the emergence of hereditary social structures in which also women occupy outstanding positions. Now, the specific occasions or reasons why women gained exceptional social status are difficult to determine. Later Roman sources of Celtic Britain at the time of the Roman conquest mention female rulers, such as the British queen Cartimandua, or the better known example of Boudicca, queen of the Iceni. She comes to power after the death of her husband, a tribal chief and Roman client king. And after personal tragedies <coughs> inflicted upon her and her family by the Romans, becomes the leader of an armed uprising of British tribes <coughs> against them, which is well known, of course. The historian Livy reports of events of the 6th century BC commenting the immigration of the Celts into Italy. According to Livy, the king of the Gallic Peterigas, Ambigatus, sent the sons of his sister to conquer new lands in northern Italy. Polybius dated this first Gallic immigration in the t into the time of Tacrinius Priscus at the end of the, uh, at the la uh, late 6th century BC, in about the time of intensive contact between Italy and Hallstatt, the Hallstatt world north, north of the Alps. But I'm well aware that we uh, should be critical towards using historical sources, but still, um, I think still it's a very appealing concept also for archaeologists to at least um, refer to them. The described, I mean in the case of Pitoligus, um, um, the described avuncular mesolinear uh, kinship models may help us to explain the special status of women in the Iron Age. And this has been pointed out by Ludwig Pauli years ago by looking at central graves of Hallstatt uh, date in southwest Germany. They acted, the women, acted within uh, the, sp the public sphere, in the public space. They had influence and should not be reduced to their role as mere performers of priestly functions or sumptuously dressed ladies. In pre-state traditional societies, domination is inseparable from the participation in religious duties. So here, there are two entangled concepts. Again, the Boudicca episode illustrates this, since she was also a priestess of the war goddess Andraste, that, that we know. Nevertheless, Boudicca's primary function was clearly that of a ruler and a military leader. Thank you very much. Вот мама драугалю, судя у я у ней сяд.